this episode of Startup Anthology, the podcast, I'll be speaking with Justin McCabe. Justin is originally from Rockwall, Texas, a small town near Dallas. He holds a bachelor's degree in organizational communication and leadership from St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. Justin is a Marine who was on active duty for four years and in the reserves for 10. After coming off active duty in 2012, Justin moved to Austin and worked as a security guard while he was completing his degree at St. Edward's University. In this episode, we'll discuss our background together, Justin's journey from military to startup life, team dynamics, leadership styles, and conflict management. I hope you enjoy this episode, and please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Let's get started. I'm here again with another episode of Startup Anthology, the podcast, and I'm interviewing a friend of mine, Justin McCabe. We work together at a startup here in town and wanted to sit down and go over some stories that we have and talk about your experience and your history and how'd you get in the startup world. Justin, introduce yourself. Hey, thanks for the intro. Super excited to see where this podcast goes. This is an idea that I've already told you how impressed I am with it, so I'm not going to just sit here and pat you on the back because we're live. So yeah, my name is Justin McCabe. I'm from a little town in Northeast Texas called Rockwall. Grew up there for a while and then uh, left, joined the Marine Corps, active duty for four years, Okinawa, deployments, the whole shebang. Then I moved to Austin in 2012, worked my way through college, ended up finding my way to St. Edward's University here in town, go Hilltoppers, make a note for the microphone that I made the really strange little goat thing with my hand. That wasn't the horns. No, it's bent like a ram. What is their mascot, by the way? The Hilltopper. The, it's well, a goat. It's a goat. With big horns. It's not a ram. It's a hilltopper goat. The ones that stand on a 20 degree incline. Very powerful animal. Prestigious. Prestigious mountain mm -hmm. goat. No football team. Clearly. No football. Of course. Mm -mm. St. Edwards wrapped that up right before COVID. And then I knocked out a... a... I, actually, I want to interrupt. I'm sorry. Okay. I remember when you graduated, because we were. it was in the midst of COVID, we were mm -hmm. already working together. And we had our weekly, daily, or whatever stand-up meeting. And Justin logs on with a mortarboard. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what have you been doing? <laughs> yeah, I was celebrating. It only took me 15 years yeah. to get my bachelor's degree. Some say late bloomer. I say I just like to take my time. I'm still blooming because I still don't have mine. There you go. Yeah. It's never too late yeah. to give into the system. I wasn't technically done when I joined the company, the startup. I was finishing up my capstone class, which anyone who's been through a capstone class knows it's still a lot of work, a lot of research. I would called a teacher friend of mine over and we had a giant whiteboard that we were doing the crazy, like connecting the points, trying to get it all cohesive. Yeah, because my mind was scattered and she was a sane person. So it really helped. 2019, I went on my last deployment with the Marine Corps. And then coming off of that, a good friend of mine called me up and said, hey man, let's grab a drink. And he started telling me about this crazy situation he was in. Is it a mutual with. friend? Yes. You know exactly who it is. So I told the DJ to lower the music. And was we, there a record scratch? Uh, uh. What? <laughs> exactly. He tells me about this idea. Although I had worked in relevant fields, it just didn't seem like anything I had a place in. Not with what I had been doing with myself professionally all the way up to then and the direction that I thought I was going to go in. I said, man, that sounds wild. That's really cool. I'd love to come see it sometime. That was my stance. Mm. And then little did I know I was being recruited. What were you for... doing when you met the DJ? Real subtle. <laughs> <laughs> I had St. Edwards, actually. What was your MOS? What was your job in the Marines? So I had a couple, right? My first job was a communications repairman, essentially. That was the root of it. But I had the fortune of joining a pretty cool unit who was very small and deployment oriented, let's say. I had myself and a couple other guys who handled all of the communication, like radios, anything that sent or received a signal. Mm. It was my job to make sure it was working, ready to go, install, take out, maintain, repair, et cetera. So I ran that shop for about two and a half years. Where? In Okinawa, Japan. I learned a lot about how to run a very small team to accommodate a large vision. We were on a pretty tight, depends on who you ask, but a pretty tight deployment schedule. It was less than a year, but we were going for seven months, coming back for 11, out seven. It was pretty quick. We mobilized 
to the Middle East and then came back. I did that for first like six or eight years in my career. And then I got recruited over to do some work in the intelligence field, which was super analytical, completely new perspective on global politics, military. A little more civvies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uniforms basically went away, grew a beard, still had to look professional, but mm -hmm. definitely a much different environment than the... You, you didn't ooze Marine. It's funny. I... Part of the selection process is finding people who can blend in a little better right. and look like a normal person as much as that's possible. But now that I still talk to a lot of my friends who are still in that world, now that I've been out of it just for a few short years, and I look at them and they're trying to look normal. It's very tough. I see a bunch of them walking by and I'll just heckle them and be like, you look like a bunch of cops. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I might not have pegged you as military, but well, you still look so... 511 Oakley, mm, you know, you're right. What a trip. Yeah. What a journey. So you met with the mutual friend of ours. They were actually recruiting you to come work at the startup. Yeah. What happened then? I remember you showing up. So this was the crazy part. In dress pants and nice <laughs> shoes. I was wearing nice shoes. So this is the crazy thing, right? The, the recruitment happened in a way that was so smart. And this isn't just a compliment to our mutual friend. This is this speaks to like how that company was built from an employee level, because these tactics were being used to get the right people. And I learned about it on the other side, especially because in a lot of the early days, we were involved with hiring. Oh, we, we, we took a step too far. Okay. Did you get a job there? Where? The place we're talking about. Yeah, I got a job there. Okay. That's how we met. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you're right. I, I got told what this company was. And I was in a stage I had just gotten back from an overseas deployment. I was on the, the last class, the last semester of finishing up my bachelor degree. And I was also a full time security guard. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. And they had moved me from a very cushy position downtown the long center, right? Was it? That was another I was doing that part time. Okay. No, I was it was with the county with Travis County. And I was had this really cush gig downtown where I really didn't do much. I unlocked some doors, patrolled, mm. et cetera, handled the occasional vagrant or insane person. But then they moved me from there to work adult probation center, which is just a utterly different environment. There was an armed guard along with me because they wanted to pay me as minimal as possible to do the job and pay another guy from a- So do you have a taser or company? pepper spray? Or just a flashlight? I had these hands, Jeremy Willis. <laughs> I had the power of my voice because I had- <laughs> Which it was a big, it's a big voice. So 6'4", <laughs> yeah. 250 pound man, 275 really. Tells you to, to empty your pockets before going through the metal detector. Most people tend to listen. It was not always the case. He had that 5'11", you know, <laughs> look. Yeah. I made sure to put my Oakleys on the desk so people knew. <laughs> I was there to do business. So anyway, I was doing all that. I was in, What I'm trying to get to is that I was in a place where I was ready and actively seeking change. And okay. I was pretty vocal about what my career goals were, right? Because mind you, I was entering my 30s and I was trying to really find what's going to be my foothold to go in a career direction that I want to choose. And some of the values that I says I want to help people in some way or fashion I want to be able to move around freely. I like to travel. I want a good amount, fair amount of autonomy and creativity in my inputs. And then here comes along this job that says, hey, do you want to do something that no one's ever done before that could potentially change and help the world? Oh, by the way, we're in this foreign country. We're going to this state next month. We are involved with this, this, and this. And it was like, it just, it felt like it fell in my lap. Yeah. But none of it was, none of it was happenstance. It was all very curated in how it was approached, right? I went out looking, I put that out into the world. Someone came to me and said, hey, I have an opportunity. And through that recruitment period, as much as I was being recruited, I was hunting, I wanted this. Hmm. I got on the website, I read it top to bottom. I learned everything I could about what the company was doing, the product, the people behind it. And so when I got invited to a casual event with a current employee that was a little bit of a test, right? Did you know they were a current employee when you met them or yes. was it? Okay. I didn't know I was going to meet them. 
Mm. I went to watch a football game. Okay. It just was like, I could see it in that person's eyes. They were like, oh, this person's taking this seriously and they don't even work here yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was, that's why I say like it, it, it wasn't handed to me in any way or shape. In fact, most of the time after the initial like, hey, this is cool. It was presented to me as this is hard. This is really hard. And of course, as a Marine, that just told me like, okay, and it, it might be worth it. Yeah, yeah, it might be worth it. And I've done hard things. I'm not scared of hard things. Yeah. You can tell me it's, in fact, in my first and only interview, real interview, I got told, this is the hardest job I've ever had. And internally, I kind of scoffed. Because I was like, Oh, like, what do you I don't know what you know about hard. Mm -hmm. I know what I know about doing hard things. Right? Shout out Goggins left my log in the parking lot. Yeah. But as I got to know that person and see their work ethic and then get involved, it became very obvious that was a true statement. And it was it, it, it did become one of the hardest things that I had to do. I remember I interviewed you when you came by the first time. And it was purely you were talking to the person you're talking about. I remember y'all walking around the building, literally around the building. And we were working on a project <clears throat> doing a lot of people were there when he handed you off. I thought you were just there to watch what was going on because there's a lot of people watching. And like you said, I was in wildly different clothing than the environment dictated. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because it was dirty, dusty, dirty. construction-ish world, but it's actually in a warehouse. Construction Anyways. adjacent. <laughs> construction adjacent in a warehouse. We were getting ready to go outside and construct. I remember we talked for a little bit. Do you remember what we talked about? Because I'm trying to remember. Yeah, they, they definitely played on the, hey, you're military, he's military. Yeah. So I think you got introduced as this is Jeremy Willis. He was in the Navy. Also, he's on the operations team, which is what you're applying for. Mm, okay. And if you remember, the job descriptions back then were electrical and well, mechanical. That, they were, but also I had to go back and look at what I originally signed up for. Mm -hmm. And it was, I thought I was in electrical. I wasn't. I was actually. The mechanical? Uh, no, I was in a field operations engineer, which was neither. Yeah. Although that would have been great if they had kept that title. Yeah, I did. It's on my resume. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> if people can call themselves techno wizards as their job title, why can't what I call can myself a field operations engineer? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it was presented to me as, oh, you're either mechanical or electrical. And I was like, like to have experience in both. But I don't want to say I'm specialist, you know? Yeah. Well. But yeah, they introduced us and I had just gotten back from my first project down there. Like mm -hmm. we had just in it. We just got back getting ready for the holidays because I think it was December. Maybe it was December. I think. It yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Because I, I didn't. I started in January, but I think we. Yeah. Because I think it was December. Did all that. We got back. We finished what we had been working on. I only been down there for a little bit. Haven't really done much. Let's see. Do you want to hear a slightly interesting story about that day? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing this for. Right? Yeah. This is a full circle thing. That day, because I had been working at the Long Center for four years doing security for them, the first interview I had that day was at the Long Center with oh. someone on the production side. They needed a new assistant. At the uh, production at the side Center. of the Long Center? Yeah. Okay. And I'd been there so long. I knew everybody. I knew the person who had held the job prior. We are, we are to this day good friends. And I actually texted him and said, hey, do you recommend applying for this job? Because you used to be in it. Is it something you think I'd be good at? Is it a job you think I would want? Because you know me, all this kind of stuff. And they were like, oh, yeah, go for it. So I went up there and I interviewed for that. And I it didn't feel quite right. I didn't get the vibe. I was like, I answered the questions okay. Everything was cordial. I just wasn't getting the right vibe. I literally hopped in my car and drove over to the other place, had that interview, which was wildly different especially because it ended with a celebration where we all went to the brewery mm. and I spent a good amount of time getting to know people in a very different light. Yeah. 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 Oh, I saw, I want to talk. Okay. Pause for a second. Yeah. Do you remember the, was it you? <laughs> I think it was you that got stuck talking to somebody that was mm -hmm. just, <laughs> it was me. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. You got stuck in got I was, stuck that party. Cause let's be real. Yeah. I was having beers with y'all, but I was still very much in an interview and I knew it. So I was glad handing anybody I could see that was affiliated. I was shaking hands. In fact, someone who we know, I talked to his girlfriend who was there for 10 minutes. Mm. And thinking that, thinking that his girlfriend was part of the company too. 
I had no idea yeah, who no anybody idea. was. But, but just did that whole circle. And yeah. You're like, it was like, if you're standing here and you're looking me in the eyes. You are either at the startup or just directly <laughs> right. adjacent to the startup. Yeah. If you're adjacent, you had no influence and, on. And also, I'm just a nice chatty guy anyway, mm. but I'm talking to people. And then someone would actually come up and be like, they're not with the company. And I'd be like, that's cool. Damn. 10 minutes yeah. gone. Yeah. I got the job at the startup. So... It's interesting how you said that you got your job here at the startup and like mm -hmm. you were looking, but then you were recruited as well. I think, what what employee number were you, by the way? 25. 25? Okay, cool. I was 23. Mm -hmm. So we were hired relatively close within two months of each other. I was in November yeah. and you were I think January. we were about six weeks apart. Okay, so a month and a half. month and a half. On my hiring experience, it was... Not like that at all. <laughs> and I think I was the first person hired that did not know somebody. Mm. A any connection completely anonymous to, I could pass anyone on the street and not know that they worked there. How did you find it? I found it through Indeed. Wow. And I found it through Indeed about six to eight months before I got hired. I read the job description at the end. It says, must love tacos. And I was like, I love tacos. <laughs> and then I applied, put my resume in and applied. I had nothing back. That, yeah. I, all I had was the Indeed confirmation, heard nothing back. And so when I got the call or the email, it was out of the blue because mm -hmm. I had completely forgotten that I had applied. And then took a while because our mutual friend, is, he was busy with to work say the least. and didn't hear back, didn't hear back, had an interview. And when I had the interview, that was on a Friday, that following Monday, I had back surgery. Mm. I had my back fused together. and so. Like, I told him, yeah, I'd love to have the job, but <laughs> I'm having this done on Monday. And so I'm out for six to eight weeks. So I, my, I couldn't start until November. Yeah. And that was in September. So you could have started earlier. I could have started earlier. You could have, got, you could have gotten a better. Yeah. A, a lower number. E equity plan. <laughs> I Which, mean, honestly, I, and I know you and I agree, maybe we wouldn't say it the exact way, but like, that was, not only was that one of my favorite places to work. But just overall, those years that yeah. we spent on that mission it stands out to me. Like I met some of my favorite people. I grew relationships. Still friends with these people now. Like, yeah, look at us. Right. Yeah. And there's also something we said about the environment that you, like you and I were in mm -hmm. of just misery breeds connection. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like a suffering misery. We all miserating. Yeah. We all chose to show up yeah. and work 16 hour days back to back. We all chose to do that stuff. And that's, you know, I know we haven't gotten onto the topic yet, but like when we talk about later phases where we were trying to address those same dynamics in a different setting, a lot of people signed up that didn't necessarily choose that or they were promised a different setting. Whereas we came in being told, you probably don't want this. Yeah. This is going to be hard. Yeah. And you're uh, going to work some crazy hours. You're going to be maybe outside <laughs> an all weather environment yeah no no we were outside the whole time you may be huddled in a corner of yeah. a vibrating trailer <laughs> it, trying to find the last two inches of shade after 12 hours in the sun or, or the last two inches of cover to get keep the rain off you yeah yeah because by the way hope your respirator filters don't get wet it's hard to breathe <laughs> yeah. it's hard to breathe with a oh, with a man. dusty wet respirator filter i had I had someone else who still at the startup asked me to tell a story because they came into that environment later once things had <laughs> gotten less hectic. And they said, what does three minutes mean to you? And I said, three minutes used to be the exact amount of time where I could start a process, run to a portage on, finish that process and be back. And I would set a three minute timer mm. because that's all I had. Yeah. And if I didn't do it in that three minute window, it wasn't happening. You know what I remember about with the Port of Johns, by the way? Yeah. Is when we were out in the field, <laughs> we always would order lunch from somewhere. Oh, like yeah. A big, like DoorDash or, mm -hmm. or, or Uber Eats or something. And we'd have Port of Johns in the middle of summer here in Austin. Mm -hmm. The Port of Johns are baking and everyone would want like curry. <laughs> I'm just like, guys, seriously, we're sharing that. We're not eating curry. I always wondered why you were so opposed to curry. That was it. That was the whole reason. <laughs> It was like, I, I love curry. I was just like, that's, you need hand foods out here. I don't want utensils. I want empanadas, tacos, pizza. Smoothies, because they're in a cup. And Juice Land, shout out to Juice Land. Not, Not a sponsor. sponsor. But could be. Could be. 
they weren't doing it on purpose, but I remember so many days where someone would show up with wellness shots mm -hmm. and a little bit of B12 and lemongrass. Mm -hmm. Oof, change your whole aspect on it, life. It changed your life. <laughs> well, for the next you know few hours. Exactly. And then it would wear off. And then you're like, I need more. <laughs> hmm, sounds a lot like something else. Yeah. That, yeah. Sorry. That was a tangent on like the bathroom <laughs> use on site. That was. No, it's that. good. Because that's the thing. That was a logistic that we had to think about throughout the day because it was so hard to get our technological version of the Kitty Hawk in the air that like once it was flying, you didn't want it to come back down. Yeah. You had, and part of you the- You had to maintain momentum. Yeah. yeah. And that was also part of what we were trying to prove was that like you could keep this thing going seamlessly for an amount of time, which was not always the case. So when it's up, you stay up. And the idea of a bodily function getting in the way of that, not unless it's part of the production, which was debated several times. Yeah. I mean, the amount of sweat that I put into those <laughs> things- I think I those things are probably 90% Jeremy. Oh, for sure. That was the magic saw yeah, was back in the day. Magic saw. Yeah. Back when there were, yeah. Remember hands, hands in? No, we don't talk about that. <laughs> Did you feel like a poser? You came in there and have this imposter syndrome? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you step into an environment and in my first real environment was a kind of a big production. Just because it had been, it, I stepped into the middle. Okay, it was already, it was ongoing. It was ongoing, and there was a rotating cast of people, so it was a, it was chaos at the same time. Right, but there was this, like what you're talking about, the imposter syndrome. It's like you could see that everyone had a unified plan, but that no one knew if it was going to work. Yeah, it was hope. It was a lot of hope. Yeah, you know, it's, it's built out of Jeremy Willis sweat and hope. <laughs> right. Yeah. And little bits of nitrile glove mixed in there. You say Jeremy Willis sweat. I would say thank you. But it was all of our sweat. Yeah. I mean, we were all out there busting ass all day, every day. Seriously. Early in the morning to well below, well, well past sunset. My first day, and I wasn't even actually hired yet. They brought me out there as a trial. I right? remember him doing that to people. That was so weird. It, w it was a little weird. I actually really enjoyed it because the pressure was off. I got to have a first day without the pressure of this is what you're stuck with. But on both ends, like I knew that whatever I saw that I liked or didn't like that day, I could walk away from. And on the opposite end of the pressure of, hey, here's your new teammate. If I came in there and stumbled all over my own feet and made a mess of things, everyone would have been like, oh, great, the new guy. Stumbling over things and messing things up, though, was, was par for the course, though. There's an art to it. I was asked on day one to my face. Are you an asshole? Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I don't think so. I said, good enough. But no, that first day I was out there for 13 hours, unpaid, still basically in my interview. And the team lead came over and said, hey, man, we've had some setbacks. We're probably going to be here another couple hours. You don't have to stay. And I didn't. <laughs> I didn't that day because I had already been out there for 13 hours. And I thought this was an eight hour trial, you know, mm. and I was like, no, nah, I, I have other things. I wasn't prepared to be here for 13 hours. Mm. I'm definitely not prepared to be here for 16, but it set the tone, set a very real tone. I was dirty. It was outside in the wind in early January and, and I was confused, right? It's like, I didn't come in and there was like a onboarding where someone was like, this is how you do things. Mm -hmm. It was, Hey, here's chaos. Sit in it. And enjoy it. If you don't freak out, and if you actually find it kind of fun, you're in the right spot. Yeah. Okay, it's on that trial interview process. That was 100% intentional, because I remember I didn't, there was no active project going on at the time when I got interviewed, but one of the guys there, he would do this thing called the bucket test. Mm -hmm. And I think we carried on that tradition for a, for a while, while until we were like scaling and hiring a whole bunch of people. It was always an observation, at least on my part. Yeah. Well, and the bucket test was while you're interviewing, you go and like mention, hey, this is something that's happening. Man, we just need more people out here helping out with this XYZ task. And then you would just leave it at that and just see what they would do. Would they go up, pick up the bucket and accomplish it? Or would they just let it be? Mm -hmm. So it would help. You could see the initiative in the person. You could see just a quick 
quick glimpse. And they might have been just nervous and not know what they're doing. And you could kind of pick up on that too, and you wouldn't. But if it was too good for them to do this because they're hiring for software position, then they wouldn't fit into mm-hmm. what we were doing. The ethos. Because yeah. the ethos had to be for that stage that we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. And that you could be the best software programmer in the world, but if there's this physical operations thing that needs to get done to get us to the next day, which is sometimes what it felt like, Mm -hmm. then you drop what you're doing and you get in there in the same way. And this is the part that I think it probably gets hyped up a little bit for those who do speak about it, but I don't think it gets enough attention, which is where the emphasis comes from. And that's that on the operations side, there was a lot of expectation to flex into very technical roles, whether it was giving feedback or helping on the R&D side. And what you really started to introduce on the on the data capture, right? Before we actually had a whole science division. Yeah, it, it, it was, was like a lot of Google Sheets and right. And we were very tacitly driven. It was like, hey, this is the method that this guy does pick the one you like, and roll forward with it. We think that it works. And it was trial and error. But it was all very tribal. Yeah, there's no process to it. it no, it wasn't nothing was documented. And what you did for data, I started to do for checklists. Yeah. And it, it blossomed from there into, oh, we have repeatable, measurable methodology here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, military training. Yeah, right. That was, yeah, checklist and procedure. It's Yeah, and how do we actually know we're effective? Yeah. How do we know we're actually achieving the the same results too? Okay, so let's do a little recap. So you started there, it was really hard. People were asking (laughs) you to do stuff and not paying you for it. And until you got hired... So what was your actual hire date? Oh, I don't remember. January something, right? It's 2021. I want to say it was like January 16th. 20. 20, because I started in 19. It was 2020. 2020, okay. Yeah. So you, you started like three like months before COVID hit. Yeah. And yeah, I that was a huge. It was massive. Huge interruption to a. I can't believe we made it, honestly. I, I can't believe the company's still going after that. I, I remember working from home and got hired as an operations engineer Mm -hmm. in the field and there is now no field there was nothing i called one of the guys i was like what's going on are we going to be okay which was a good thing we had finished a funding round and we had plenty of cash and so we weren't worried about losing anything and i i was surprised we all stayed it was good on the process side because it made us write our first user manual or Whatever that was. Whatever that was, that 700-page <laughs> document that everyone contributed to. Oh, man, that was insanity. That was so crazy because I think a lot of us were nervous that we weren't going to have a job the next day. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we were also obsessed with what we were doing that the request of, I need you to write down everything you know about this. People were excited about that for a chance to actually stop moving for a moment and put all that knowledge and experience together. And it was not easy because none of us got hired on as technical writers. None of us got hired on for our skill sets in team collaboration to produce a written manual. Do you remember, I I call it, it was like the transition first Friday. Mm. It was the last time when we had- Pigeon? Yes, just right there in the lobby of the Mm. building we were in. The the last time we met, as I, I would call small team, we had just finished a major project that funding uh, hinged on. Mm -hmm. We were successful. Funding came through. It was a celebration of that. But also, it was, okay, it's going to start changing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go from everyone being a generalist who is really good at everything they do to specialists who do one thing very well. Mm -hmm. And I kept that in my mind because our boss shortly thereafter moved Mm -hmm. on because he's no... I'm not a specialist in this. I got us to this point and that's it. I need, I need to hand it off. And I remember thinking, well, am I a generalist or am I a specialist? Because mm. I, I had no idea. When I left the company a couple of weeks back, I realized I left because I was unhappy because I am a generalist. Mm-hmm. I do a lot of things very good, mm-hmm. nothing very well, which is fine. So I realized that I'm a, a generalist. I like the early stage where you have to put things together with duct tape and zip ties. And you have to build it out of two by fours from the trash. There's no CAD. There's no Revit. There's no, it's just a lot of 
shoot from the hip. Yeah. And you'll find Let's it right if it works or doesn't. And if it doesn't, you just shoot from the hip again. Yeah. Just keep shooting. It's and, and I'm the same way, which is, I think th- there was some terminology thrown around back then of what was the word? It was a scrappy, scrappy cowboys or something. That was the words that were given to us on the qualities that we displayed. And I find a lot of pride in that, right? There was a very simple day where I was tired of sitting in the sun, in the Texas summer sun all day long and getting fried. And it was like, I had purchased this camo netting and put up Mm. and then I couldn't get it to work right. So I ended up putting like a shovel in a bucket full of gravel and then using that as the attachment point for the other end of the shade and like making a lean to. And I remember even that people would walk by and they were like, oh, that's a great innovation. It was like, thanks. It's really nothing special. It's going to fall apart in a couple hours. I remember that thing. Right? Yeah. It was like it was a, blind. Right. Yeah. But it was like, this is the kind of thing that as soon as we started getting budgets. It's the first thing that went away. It was the idea of this next project is coming up. We want to do it right. We want to do it with a budget. And we want to do it this. I started to fade off. Yeah. Because those are the environments in which I can operate. But like you said, that's a, like a, that's a specialty thing. It's like, we have no money, we have no time, but this needs to happen. I'm there for it every single time. It's definitely Billy Baldwin and Half-Baked. Thank you for that reference. Yeah, 100%. I need a, I need an apple core, yeah. a snorkel, and some duct tape. We don't have an apple core. I made more with less. Don't worry, guys. Less. Yeah. Maybe it's growing up to watching MacGyver. I don't know. Yeah. Or, or MacGyver. Yeah. I mean. Pick your generation. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I know you and I had a, a snippet of this conversation before, and The way I think about myself is like a multi-tool. I mean, that's self-reliance in that was huge, even in the military for me. So I was on submarines, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's only so many things you can take and people that you could take on a submarine. And Mm. my role, I was a a nuclear mechanical operator, but I was also the welder and the machinist on board. And on any surface ship, any aircraft carrier, which has abundance of space, they have individuals who are welders mm-hmm. and they have individuals who are machinists and they had individuals who were nuclear machinists made special on carriers. But I had to have that all in one. So I actually had three mm-hmm. in the Navy. There's like MOSs and you had to be scrappy because mm-hmm. no one's going to come and rescue you when you're under the water. You had to figure out how to do it on your own. And then you put together with duct tape, go back in and then you leave and someone else takes on that process that you, you know, right. scrap together. So. Well, that's what I love about working with this place. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that I realized is working long hour, working in the environment that was hot, cold, wet, not, I mean, it's dry, whatever, just in the <laughs> not environment. Wet. Yeah. <laughs> it's Central Texas. Working in an environment like Central Texas outside the entire time, never know what kind of weather you're going to end up with. Dirty, hungry, sweaty, dusty, all those things that go along. It sucked. <laughs> but I always wanted to come to work early, be there the entire time. That it was the people, right? Mm -hmm. It was the people that I was around, the people that made this whole vision and dream come to something tangible. And that was the being a part of that was really fun. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'm gonna do another little Goggins type shout out here. But, you know, the the kind of metaphor of carrying the boats, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I've carried boats. I was part of a recon unit. Yeah. It sucks. It's like what you were saying, right? It's all these different things. And it doesn't matter how good you get at it, how much you prepare yourself, it still sucks. Mm -hmm. And if you think it doesn't suck, then you're deluding yourself or it does. Yeah. Yeah. Embrace the suck, Mm -hmm. which is a common phrase. But it's one of these things where it's hard. Let me put it that way. It's always hard in some way, because the better you get at it, the more you push yourself to do it in a better way or a harder way, because you want to accomplish. You want to always go faster. Right. You Mm -hmm. always want to do more especially in a startup where the whole goal is to grow. But the, the point that I wanted to make about carrying the boat is that when you're carrying a boat, you know that your suffering is shared amongst the other people carrying that boat. And what you don't want is to relieve your suffering to it, if it means increasing their suffering. As long as we're all suffering in this equally together, and, and by that I mean you're putting out as much as you can, You don't mind picking up a little slack for somebody else because you You know they will later. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about we all have to get this thing to the water or whatever that goal is. And I remember specifically one of the projects that 
you and I went out to on a weekend in between other projects. It was one of these, it was like a one day thing. And we had collaborated with other entities and everyone had showed up. And logistically, we needed to get it done in one day. Okay. And I had to leave. And I, I felt horrible because mm -hmm. I had to ask you to come take my place. And you had other stuff. It's like there were so many aspects of that project. And people kept telling me, they were like, dude, if you need to go, go. We'll pick up where you left off. But the sense of teamwork, the sense of pride in what we were doing, the sense of investment and wanting to be there for those critical moments, especially finishes, mm -hmm. right, was it was I'm not torn because I have some allegiance to work. I am torn because I am willing to sacrifice these other parts of my life rival what I'm getting out of this experience. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I'll say in hindsight, I'll actually amplify that sentiment to the fact that I wish I had invested a little bit more sometimes. And that's crazy to say, because I know how much time and effort we put in. But now that I'm looking back as a, in a historical context, these moments that I'm going to be able to tell stories to my kids that they're not going to believe, right? I tell people now, and they think I'm blowing hot air. And it's like, no, no, I was in this space doing this project. I can take you across town and I can show you what I built. Now, I didn't do it by myself, but like my hands, my work. My sweat equity yes. is in those things. In those things directly. And there's a lot of pride in that. That's what's also beautiful about making something that lasts for a long time, whether it's a company or any sort of artifact. Well, that was actually one thing that I was had a lot of thought about as I was leaving is unlike other startups, like tech startups, software startups, mm -hmm. you might have, you have software that changes pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. What we were doing was we were messing with molecules, right? We weren't messing with bits. We could, no matter how fast we did something or how much effort we put, we could still go see it. It's a monument to our effort. Mm -hmm. Whether the tech stack changes or not, we could still go say, oh, I did that and there it is, which is incredible. So I, that's a little bit different of this startup that we were in as compared to like your stereotypical tech think, world. Yeah, tech world startup yeah. because we can go and still touch it, see it, visit yeah. it, which is really cool. And I feel like the artifacts of our work stand the earliest works that we did mm -hmm. as a startup, the quality of design, the quality of execution right? Those things compared to what's being produced now, I don't think it loses its significance, even though there's been a vast amount of improvement. Okay. I think seeing, okay, we did this level of execution with this level of technology and ability. And then today they are producing something of higher quality and higher design, but they also have higher technology that's based off of the foundational work. So I'm going <laughs> to change the conversation up a little bit, switch a little bit. How many people are you still in some sort of relationship with, be professionally, personally, mm -hmm. friendships, whatever, from the time you're at the startup to now? In the ballpark of 30. By the 25 initial. Oh, out of, out of those yeah, people? See. I feel like I could call anyone. Okay, that's fair, because I do too. Yeah. Now, there are some people that we just never had a super close relationship. Yeah. and that's But you can still probably call them. Yeah, especially for a professional reference, or or I wouldn't say I would necessarily call them in a hard spot, but... Yeah, definitely. The the core that core group of people, the first thirty people, were not to put myself in the adjective of this, but they were amazing people. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from being around those people. So you were number twenty five. When did you leave the startup? That was December of twenty twenty two. What this might be a little sensitive, but this is the whole point of this. Yeah. Why did you separate? Okay. And broad breaststrokes. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to be really transparent about this too, because it wasn't all one-sided either. I had had conversations with, within the company that I saw myself moving on eventually. Mm -hmm. I see the trajectory. I'm not mad about it. I just think like what we're talking about today, the environment's changing in a way that I might not be as useful here as I was before. And right. I didn't want to do the kind of grandfathered, and it, I had a hard time navigating that dynamic with all of the new people because how many times did we have a conversation about the same topic over the years when new people would come in 
oh, you think this is hard? We did it this way before? Or No, it was, it was more like I sat in a big meeting of people and we were talking about an issue in the operational field, which towards the end I was no longer a part of. Mm. But because I was part of HR, right? I, I had my, I had sat in on a lot of oh business wide okay. things, right? right? Right. And so I'm sitting in on a meeting and we're discussing some operations issues regarding safety and planning and training. And I held my hand up and I said, that thing that you're talking about as a policy or a rule has been a policy or a rule for two and a half years. I know because I wrote it. I have the documents. And I sound snippy right now because I felt that way. Yeah. In the moment, I was trying to be more helpful in the sense of like, why are we repeating our lessons? That's kind of the whole point. But it was one of those things where so many people got on board at the same time that they just got muddled. Also, they just they didn't have the longevity and there wasn't a bunch of handover. There, yeah. Okay. You know, of here's the lessons learned in these positions because we were creating a lot of new positions as well. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no shade here. It was just I saw I was like, oh, they're going to recreate a lot of the work that we had done already. And I'm going to feel a certain way about that. And I, I have not positioned myself to be in the driver's seat of that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was my choice. So I had the conversation with people. I think at the time that I had the conversation, I said, in six to nine months, I want to look at transitioning out of my current role. And I was very transparent in saying, hey, I either want to transition to somewhere else, maybe wherever it's needed. Because mm -hmm. once again, that's what I enjoy. Yeah. I started a department there from scratch and it was like, okay, this thing's been started. It's going to hit a certain like rolling point, And then I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to innovate, yep. imp implement and discern like mm -hmm. what needs to be there and then build that up initially, make that foundation and then hand it off. Yeah. Cause I am not a closer, mm -hmm. but, and I don't think you are either. Mm -mm. We're definitely, let's get the ball rolling. Yeah. I like to have ideas and I like to, get them started and hype them up and, and get them to a point where someone else can really take off with it. I don't really want to maintain. Maintain or, or close it out to, mm -hmm. to fruition. Well, especially on things that... I don't, don't have enough attention to detail on that for well, me personally. I have a lot of anxiety around it. So I'll, I'll sit there and tweak it, right? That's the creative well, that's side of me. Do. Right. Yeah. That's the creative side. And we'll never finish it. Because it's never done. Yeah, because we're constantly tweaking. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so yeah. if you need it to be closed... I'm not your guy, typically. Obviously, there's things, everyone's got to do things. Yeah. But someone actually said about me one time, they said, because they asked him, hey, is this person a good fit for this role or whatever? And he said, if you want to pay someone to think about your problems, Justin McCabe is your man. <laughs> and oh, I know that, that could be taken as an insult or as a highlight oh, of that's my, actually, how I function. I would take that as a highlight if it was me. Jeremy Will's coming and think about your problems. Yeah. You want to get to the root of why you have problems? Process guy. Yeah. yeah. Call Jeremy Willis. You want to sit there and come up with a solution? Get Justin in the room. You know what I mean? Now, if you actually want to fix the problem, they're going to need a team of doers. Mm -hmm. And they'll be there in there. Because yeah, that's you, the way we work, you have to be in there with your hands in the mess to be real about the problem. Yeah, that's true. Like, you, you that's actually, I didn't think about it that way. Like... I was really good at pointing out what the problem was. Like, we all knew there's a problem. Cool. I'll tell you it's this and this. And here's my thought of some solutions. Mm -hmm. Cool. You'd pick it up and say, cool, those are the problems. This is what we do to fix those. Yeah. Then. And then we'd come up with that. And then we could hand that off to somebody else and say, now this is what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also, because as generalists, I'm willing to go in. As a generalist, I'm so willing. And sometimes, like, confidently ignorant if you will because mm. it's like if i was in a if this was a surgery thing and you were like i've identified it as the pancreas and i was like hey i have an operation that i know will fix the problem but i'm not the surgeon you're not the surgeon right and he only has a pancreas yeah and if there's no surgeons available i'd be like i don't know give me a scalpel i'm going in yeah I, i'm pretty sure i can do this i might mess some stuff up on the way oh they might die like the chance Maybe. is pretty, pretty I mean, high. there was always a chance, right? Yeah. But you know how they'll definitely die with that pancreas still inside of them. Yeah. But that's my approach. If someone has to do it, I'll take the risk. And, and that's where it's, if you empower me with a team of people that can actually have the skill set to follow out the plan, right? I'm there for it. Because let's face the facts. Sometimes the doers and the thinkers, they're not different people. They're just in different positions, different perspectives. Like energy in different ways. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is 100% true. It's like we started hiring a lot of people that were doers mm-hmm. there, which is what we needed. But then also we'd hire doers to fill a need, and they were actually thinkers and schemers and planners, mm-hmm. and they were totally unhappy. Or vice versa, we put a doer into a role of a thinker or a schemer. I'm calling it schemer as a, as a, in a good yeah. way. And they would be unhappy. Yeah, I saw that a lot. Yeah. In fact, that's actually a really common management process mm-hmm. that, that gets taught by consulting agencies. Just because someone is technically proficient in their job does not mean they are suitable to lead others, right? Mm. You can be the best at your job technically. It doesn't mean that you know how to educate others. It doesn't mean you know how to lead others. And it doesn't mean that you know how to do the higher level processes well or that you'll enjoy those things. Okay. And what we see a lot of times, especially in startups, is, oh, I hired this person. They're really good at their job. I want to reward them. So you put them in like the manager, manager you move road, them up. road plan. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a, not roadmap. Yeah, roadmap. Oh, manager roadmap. Yeah. Instead, they should have probably just hung out in the individual contributor roadmap. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I learned this very poignantly because I got moved into a management position, which is what I wanted. Yeah. But then I started, as we started to flesh out the team, and it was like, hey, we need to bring other people up to be in other management positions. I started interviewing people on the ops side to feel for, hey, who's able and willing? And there was one individual who was so talented and had such a great demeanor. Everyone loved them. It was like Mm -hmm. a natural, it was a natural inclination to put this person into leadership. And when we sat down and talked, they looked me square in my face and said, I would rather die. Yeah. I don't. I'm glad they knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a self-awareness that really took me off guard. And I had to sit in my own discomfort. So for me. And finish the interview. Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, as someone who's a little ambitious and who not every time, but very often wants to step into some sort of leadership role, because I like that level of control Mm -hmm. for that response. I was like, how could you not? Well, how could you not want this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, just the opposite of that. When I I thought I wanted to always just be an individual contributor mm-hmm. and just, you know, swoop in, do the thing and leave. Like Batman. Like like Batman. And like you never know when he's coming. But I thought that was what would make me happy because I've had other experiences like, oh, I'd, I'd rather just do it on my own mm-hmm. instead of manage people. But I actually have found that I, I get joy out of teaching and managing and and helping people to think through things and and directing them and so like that. Actually, I am glad I ended up in a manager's role because I mm-hmm. I was actively trying not to. Well, you you had a really great experience. I'm speaking for you. That's fine. Just from an outside perspective, you you can totally correct me here. But you had a really good pairing of who was on your team, and so you got to manage people who were aligned, capable and open to learning something new. Obviously, there's probably a lot of nuance to that. Yeah. And every team has someone who clashes with the leadership a little bit. But it's like, man, what an opportunity to build what you built in that one particular segment and to be, to flex into that role in a way that was probably very gratifying. It was. It was stressful and gratifying at the same time. It was a different yeah. type of stress. I, I actually really enjoyed working with that team and, and building it out. It was... It was very much the same thing. It was like I got an opportunity to do a little startup again within the startup to take on and develop this team and try to find people that had the abilities and the knowledge, but also who had that, who's an old timey word, gumption mm-hmm. that uh, to put in the long hours, do whatever it takes to get it done, not happy with just the status quo and not clocking in, just clocking out, but actually would have that passion and that that drive. Mm-hmm. And it was fun to make that team. Yeah. Cool. If that's what you saw outside looking in, that was the intent. Right. Yeah. I'm, good. I'm glad that, that was seen by someone else who wasn't in that circle. Yeah. Anybody at the startup like really annoy you, frustrate you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about the unstoppable force against the immovable oh. object. You know, what? that's funny you say that because that's not actually what I associate that dynamic with oh really yeah but that that's something it was entertaining to me though i bet that's so that's a part of that's a part of my personality i enjoy mental sparring 
Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let that soak in for a second. Mm -hmm. But so, to that so degree, hold, hold on. go ahead. You're just a contrarian. Is that what you're saying? No, it's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Although I've been called that before. I, I heard a really great analogy the other day. It was about comedians, right? And it was about this group of comedians who gets together in a specific bar and they tell jokes and they rip on each other and they make fun of each other for the sake of being in a comedic environment and being able to hone their talents against mm. each other. Okay. And the quote was something to the lines of, if you're in that room and you start to get offended, you need to leave. Right. Because that room, that setting, those people, they do it deliberately not to hurt each other's feelings, right? It's all comedy, but they do it to sharpen their skills. The same way boxers spar, mm -hmm. they're not doing it to hurt each other, but guess what? You're going to get hit in the face. Yeah. It's part of the training. It's part of the practice, right? You need to yeah, build up your, your not resiliency, but build up, I guess it's resiliency. Resiliency, tolerance, sensitivity. Tolerance, that's what I think of. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like no Deep one increase likes. Your sensitivity, increase your tolerance. No one likes getting hit in the face. Let me rephrase that. Most people don't like getting hit in the face. 90% of people yeah. don't. Most people don't like getting hit in the face, right? But if you choose to be in a boxing gym, if you mm. choose to spar with someone else, you, it's inevitable you're you going to. Yeah. And so if you're going to make the choice to get hit in the face on a regular basis, then, then you choose to increase your tolerance to it, right? And that's the difference. And that's why I say mental sparring. If I'm going to get into an arena where we're going to challenge each other over ideas, process, opinion, you know, all this stuff. Sure. It's, I'm not ever trying to hurt someone else through that, that conflict process. I want you to stand your ground. Mm. Tell me why your idea works, right? Not even necessarily asking you to convince me. Just explain the logic you used to get there, because why should I believe you over my own instinct, Right. And now there are times, like when I was dealing with people that had multiple PhDs that were explaining things to me that made my head scratch, mm -hmm. where I told them to their face, I'm going to hit the I believe button, and I'm going to take you at your word, because that's what you're hired here to do. Yeah. They're very, very specialized. Yes. And being in the military, they give us an I believe button. Right. That you have to take with Which you. Which is exactly work. where I got it. Yeah. But if I'm dealing with something where those areas start to be much more cross-sectional, mm -hmm. where it's operational, it's logistical, and you're and in the instance that you're referencing to, right, it was from a design to operation, right? That was the delta. And I will sit down in an uncomfortable space and say, I think it should be this. You're telling me there's reasons why that won't work. I need you to explain those reasons in a way that's going to prevent me from seeing out my plan. And until you tell me thoroughly why you believe what you believe, I have no obligation to think any differently. And I, that's stubborn, right, mm -hmm. as a mule. But at the same time, I want people to step up into that mental arena and show me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, they did. And Oof, when y'all entered there. that arena, it was very entertaining. Thank you. To sit Thank back you. and just watch and... Actually, I might have some videos of that arena. Oh, I, I might have to go back and and look because it was, it was that type of entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, for reference, the phrase "when a immovable object means it means an unstoppable force" was coined for that situation because they were just like you. yeah. And I'll tell you right now, I love that person to death. That's one of the people that I could call to this day. Yeah, and oh, and really? we'll go grab drinks. Cool. Yeah. See, that is open dialogue, yeah. right? And this is the thing that I think it's muddled a lot. That right there is open mindedness, right? Mm -hmm. That you can have dissenting opinions, dissenting arguments, and yet still go have a beer and tell them how ugly they are or how <laughs> wonderful you are, right? And you no, know, it's just your friendship. It, it trumps the ideology. And this is me getting a little high level here, but all relationships are foundationally reliant on three things, trust, communication, and respect, mm -hmm. right? But the thing about the scenario we were just talking about with me and another very stubborn, driven individual, there was always a foundation of respect in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe it hinted away from it once or twice, but there was ultimately respect at the end of it. We mm -hmm. would shake hands and walk away. Yeah, go have a beer. We go. came back and it was like, I don't think you're a bad person. It's, we just disagree. Did you actually have that conversation? Yeah. Oh, cool. What you're talking about is the 
that my initial impetus for Startup Anthology is to learn these stories and hear about them and sit around and talk. And even the uncomfortable ones. We could do so much more. Yeah. I do want to invite you back. This actually turned, this turned into more of a topical type of conversation than actually just like biographical. Mm. It has aspects of both, but I'm going to be starting another series on topical questions that I have to answer or just specific topics that would be helpful to people. So I want to definitely invite you back. We can just Thanks, I'd love to. Thanks for listening to another episode of Startup Anthology, the podcast. We'll be starting a topical series soon, so please comment about what topics you would like to hear about or comment and tell us about your story in the startup world. If you enjoy listening, please subscribe to get updated information and notified of new episodes. Please make sure to like and share each episode. Join me next time for another episode in which we will talk to more people who have worked at startups and learn about their unique journeys.